Okay, well, uh, hello, hello, welcome everyone to our academic uh, showcase. Um, this is uh, this is the premier event for UC Center Sacramento's academic program each quarter, and um, we really look forward to it. It's an opportunity to uh, get to listen to the results of the hard work that you, the students, have been doing, and also to acknowledge the um, uh, the contributions of our internship hosts, without whom we wouldn't re really be able to run an experiential learning program like the one we do. So um, uh, everybody tends to be a little bit nervous at the beginning, um, but we we look at this as just an opportunity to listen and to celebrate and to uh, to inquire and for all of us to learn some things that we didn't know before. So uh, that happens for me every quarter. I hope it happens for you. So let's get going. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Kravitz. So the format for today is that each student will present. Um, after each student presents, there'll be time to take one question from the internship host site. And if there isn't a question from the internship host site, then we'll turn it over to the academic team. And then the next student will go ahead and present. Um, we will have open Q&A today at the end of the session. And so if you do have a question for one of our students and didn't get a chance to ask it um, during the time right after their presentation, um, just hold on to your question until the end and we will go ahead and get to it. And for um, asking questions, if you could raise your hand, that would be fantastic. So to start us off, so our first student is Ananya Bapat, who interned with the California Community College Student Success Center. Hello. Um, I'll share my screen right now. Great. So. Can everyone see this? Yep, looks great. Thank great. you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to first say thank you everyone for hopping on the Zoom meeting bright and early at 9 a.m. Um, you'll get to see a great collection of all our students and all our work, and I hope everyone enjoys. And with that, hello, my name is Ananya Bapat. I'm a fourth year political science student at UC Davis. And I'd like to talk about college academic advising. Navigating college is a very difficult thing to do and finding the right people and right resources along the way is very crucial, especially for transfer students looking to move from a community college to a four-year university. I researched how the involvement of community college academic advising affects the preparedness of transfer students. I predict that academic advising positively impacts the academic and transfer preparedness of these students. To do this, I surveyed transfer students across the UC system, gathering data directly from the students themselves. Through the Transfer and Reentry Center at UC Davis, I reached out to similar transfer centers across the UC system and received feedback from 70 students who had transferred from California Community College. Uh, figure one reflects a map for where the data was collected from. I asked these students about their use of academic services while in the community college, their preparedness to transfer um, prior to academic or post academic appointments and the impact of these services on their academic confidence. I found that after meeting with an academic advisor, 30% of transfer students reported feeling more confident in their ability to transfer, which can be seen in figure two, uh, noting the increase in 15 to 21% in column five. Figure three shows that students of color were highly impacted by academic advisors. My study shows that community college transfer advisors are crucial to students' academic journeys. These findings imply that providing academic advisors with more support um, to improve their counseling will in turn ensure to better support students and ensure that more students will successfully transfer out of the California community colleges and into our larger college and university system. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ananya, for that great presentation. And so um, we're going to go ahead and turn to the audience here. So, Sarah, Adan? Thank you. Um, Ananya, great presentation. I'm just going to brag. It was wonderful to work with this, this term. Um, so one question I have for you, what was the most interesting finding from your study? Or what was the most surprising finding for you? Yeah, um, my surprising study was how low people's confidence were prior to academic uh, advising. I personally had a really, you know, mid, like middle to high confidence, but I learned that a lot of other transfer students really did not feel confident at all about their academic journeys and how that number kind of increased the more 
that um, they started like talking to academic advisors. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Fantastic, thank you so much, Sarah, for the question. And thank you, Nani, for that great presentation again. And so our next student is Rachel Suarez, who interned with Ed Trust West. Hi, everybody. Let me get my presentation going. Can everybody see that? Yep, looks great, Rachel. Excellent. So hi, my name is Rachel Suarez. I'm a education and public policy double major at UC Riverside. Um, my research focuses on the effects of student to counselor ratios and transfer rates to community colleges, UCs, and CSUs. So for some background knowledge, uh, the American School Counselor Association re recommends a ratio of 250 students to every counselor. In California, that ratio is closer to 708 to 1. Um, also, California ranks near the bottom 50 states in percentage of students transferring directly to a four-year institution after high school. Um, so the goal of my research was to see whether statistically, through a statistical analysis, we could see the effects of counselor to student ratios upon these transfer rates. Um, I hypothesized that as the number of students per counselor increase, that A, transfer rates to community colleges would increase, and B, transfer rates to CSUs and UCs would decrease. My findings actually found that there was no correlation to community college transfers, but there was a negative moderate correlation as far as transfer rates to CSUs and to UCs. These, uh, these um, findings support the idea of finding a way to increase the number of counselors per student in California high schools, as well as considering increasing the rate of counselors joining the field as it's been projected from 2016 to 2026, there would only be a 13% increase. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rachel, for that great presentation today. And so if there's a question from the audience. All right, and then if not, going over to the academic team. I'll ask a question, oh. Cindy. Um, Rachel, can you say a little bit about um, the particularly the the need for counselors for the transfer process, and in, in particular beyond just kind of going straight to college, but the the actual transfer from community college to CSU and UC? Yeah, you know, speaking for myself, I'm a two time community college transfer student. So um, as Ananya also put, you know, it, it affects your uh, confidence in transferring. You got financial aid is a big topic right now. We're trying to see more students filling out things like the FAFSA and the um, the DACA documents so that students can transfer with some confidence that they'll have financial aid. Um, advisors encompass a lot of different things, and I, I don't think people realize just how much students kind of re rely on that, especially if you come from a household as like a first generation student, maybe your parents have never navigated something like this before. So counselors in high school, I think in my opinion, are really, really impactful. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kerlander for that question. And thank you, Rachel, for a great presentation today. And so our next student is Lawrence Kim, who interned with the Office of California Assembly member, Josh Hoover. All right, thank you. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, looks great, Lawrence. All right, um, just like Cindy introduced me. Hi, my name is Lawrence, a political science major at UC Davis. As you may know, affirmative action has been in the spotlight with two Supreme Court cases soon to be ruled on. With it being a hot topic issue, I found interest in researching it and seeing the effects it has in either its implementation or ban, as well as the pros and cons of taking into race into account in the college admissions process. My evaluation of affirmative action took into account both the rate of diversity throughout a 10 to 15 year period and student achievement. I propose that although schools who implement affirmative action may have higher diversity rates compared to schools that ban it, 
Schools will have lower student achievement levels shown through graduation rates. Student achievement in this study is defined as graduation rates as what good does it do to get accepted to a university but not end up receiving a diploma. This paper consisted of a time series analysis based on states that either allow or ban affirmative action, which then measures its effect or lack thereof through diversity rates in correlation with graduation rates. The variable this project studied specifically were students of underrepresented minorities as affirmative action primarily affects minority students. The universities I chose to take data from were nine UCs and three non-UC universities. Although only two graphs are shown, my findings for the universities that banned affirmative action were consistent in that they had a substantial drop in diversity the following couple of years. However, they have increased the diversity rate throughout a gradual process. In, in California specifically, after affirmative action was banned, both the diversity rate and graduation rates have steadily increased even to a greater extent compared to schools that use affirmative action. To caveat this research project, the results did not attempt to find causality, but rather be a deep analysis on whether or not affirmative action is a useful tool in bridging the achievement gap. Thank you. All right, Lawrence, thank you so much for that great presentation. If there's a question from the audience. All right, and then if not, we'll go over to our academic team. All right, Dr. Quila. Hi, Lawrence. Really nice presentation. I was just wondering, you know, what have schools done besides, you know, if you know that band for have they done other have they done other things to help to try to increase the diversity of their um of their student body? Yeah, actually, one thing I found or found interesting was one, I guess, hindrance to the diversity rate was um Actually, the international rate or international student acceptance has tremendously increased exponentially since 2010, 2015 until now. And one thing I found was UC Davis actually admitted 26% of its applicants were international students. So maybe that's not something that UCs have done because of course UCs have done many other programs, including listing their 14 factors that they take into account in admissions. That's one thing that improved the diversity rate, but then also one thing that has not improved diversity rate was like, the inc incredible increase in international students and not saying anything against international students, but this has maybe hurt even the effects of affirmative action in schools like UT Austin or University of North Carolina where they allow affirmative action. No, thank you. Hey, thanks so much for that great presentation, Lawrence. And so our next student is Joanne Paragus, who interned with Environment California. Hi, I'm gonna share my screen right now. You see that glass? Yes, great, thank you, Joanne. Hi, everybody. My name is Joanne Paragus, and I am a fourth year political science at UC Davis. Let's do my research. We ask ourselves why students tend to refrain from engaging within their civic rights. The usual answer people assume is that they're unaware, too young to realize and understand what they can do about the events surrounding them. That's the question I'll be looking to answer in my research. Does civic education in high school affect the civic engagement of students? I propose that availability and access to civic education will increase the participation of students in the civic space. I performed a study of the 50 California County to determine whether or not this relationship exists. The data I use is a publicly available listing of public school civic classes and enrollment in them from 2018 to 2019, as well as voter registration from the 2020 primary and general presidential elections within the different California counties. I do acknowledge that a certain portion of students after graduation move in it limits my studies. However, I also recognize that a sheer chunk of that population stays in the area or at least within California, considering that about 11% of California public high school students who do enroll in college enroll out of state. I found that there is a weak positive relationship between enrollment in civic classes and youth voter registration for both the primary and general elections. This showcases that although civic classes and, uh, can be associated with civic engagement, this doesn't mean that they necessarily cause civic engagement. Due to the nature of civic education being integrated into history and social sciences in California, there's little information on the full impact of civic classes on students' civic engagement. For future studies, the curriculum and quality of classes should be observed, considering that the age range of those labeled youth voters is also larger than the age range of those in high school who are eligible to register and to vote. 
There also needs to be more specificity in the data to observe the relationship better. There are also impacts of non-mandated but encourage civic engagement opportunities as well as motivators like politicized events and socioeconomic factors that need to be controlled for or observed in future research. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Joanne, for that great presentation. And if there is a question from the internship host site. And if not, then over to the academic team. Paige Pelton. Great work, Joanne. I had a question about your sampling strategy. So how did you collect data on civics classes per county? Uh, and did you at all look at partisanship of a county and how that might impact the relationship between engagement or civics education and voter engagement? I did take the data from um, the California Department of Education. They released um, the amount of classes within each county and how much students enrolled in them within each category, so history, social sciences, math, and everything, et cetera. Um, and I did not actually look into the partisanship of um, each county, um, which would also be a really great thing to research in the future. So yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Paige, for the question. Thank you, Joanne, for that great presentation. All right, so our next student today is Bianca Vasquez, who interned with the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. All right, I think she may have, she may have dropped off. So while she's rejoining, um, why don't we move to Angelica Martinez, from, who interned with Catalyst California. everyone. Um, my name is Angelica. Uh, is my screen sharing okay? Yes, it looks great. Great, yeah. All right. So uh, I'm a third year political science student at UC Davis, and my research follows the um, relationship between uh, descriptive representation and substantive representation in the California Assembly. Alrighty, so um, in 2017, there were more white men named Jim in the California legislature than Black and API women combined. Historically, people of color in the U.S., have been underrepresented in state legislatures with the problem exacerbated for women of color. In my study, I evaluated if descriptive representation of Latino and Black communities results in substantive representation in policymaking. I also asked the same of women's representation with an emphasis on the representation of women of color. I hypothesized the women of color in the legislature will be most supportive of gendered and racialized issues, more so than men of color, white women, and white men. I compared assembly members' race and gender from the 2012, 2016, and 2020 elections with the resulting legislative outcomes from the, from the following legislative year. Legislative outcomes are measured using legislative scorecards that rate legislators on a scale from zero to 100 for their level of support for racialized and gendered issues. In figure two, I find that Latino and Black representatives of both genders are consistently more supportive of POC-friendly legislation than white men and women. In figure three, I find that white representatives are less supportive of gendered issues than legislators of color, with white men being slightly more supportive of gendered issues on average than white women. However, the result for men and women of color suggests more uniform support for women's issues. In figure four, I observe that support for gendered issues is more conditional on party than gender. I specifically find that Democratic men and women are overall far more supportive of women's legislative priorities than Republican men and women. In sum, a legislator's race is a strong indicator of their support for legislation that supports the priorities of minority communities, but a legislator's gender is a less significant predictor of a legislator's support for gendered issues than their political party affiliation. Future research should focus on the divisiveness of gendered issues along party lines. Um, they should evaluate uh, a legislator's possible stronger intrinsic connection to their party over the intrinsic connection to their demographic groups. In California, the sample size for Republicans is extremely limited, so it's really difficult to draw firm conclusions about Republican attitudes towards racialized and gender legislation. Thank you all for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Angelica, for that great presentation. And if there is a question from the internship host site, Calif, California. Yes, uh, Calis, California. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dahlia King with Calis, California. I'm proud to have hosted Angelica. She did an amazing job. Um, and Angelica, uh, again, amazing job. I'm curious if you had um, any initial or any additional <clears throat> insight when it comes to like intersections, like uh, uh, did it ever cross your mind to think about like, okay, so women of color, 
because it's not so much as being a woman, it's not so much being a person of color, but being a woman of color in that space. Um, yeah, I did kind of, um, I did um, separate it. It was just uh, hard to find a scorecard specifically that focused on uh, women issues of women of color, like specifically. So um, uh, there, instead of like the broad women of color, it's like more like um, together. I separated them into like or like combined like the scores into like the same categories if that makes sense yeah so um but there wasn't really very much effect I guess um just because of the difference in like the scores and like the lack of I guess ability to find like the like legislation priority yeah thank you all right thank you Cezalia for the question and thank you so much Angelica again for that great presentation um and then our next student is Bianca Vasquez who interned with the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Are you able to see my? Um, it's not coming up yet, so we'll just give it a sec. Yeah, so Bianca, we don't we don't see it yet. You might want to go ahead and try turning off your video and seeing if kind of that helps in terms of maybe the network internet. Okay. Oh, we see it now. Thank you, Bianca. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah, Bianca, I'm going to go. Yeah, perfect. If you want to go ahead and turn off the video and then try resharing your screen, that'd be great. Yep, looks great. Thank you, Bianca. Are you able to hear me? Yep, we are. Okay, great. Okay, so hi, everyone. My name is Bianca Vasquez. I'm a student at the University of California at Riverside. Um, the research question that I was particularly interested in was, how does the University of California system serve student mental health? Um, mental health has been a long pressing problem that negatively affects college statewide. And while there is constant improvements across online um, campuses, there's still not enough for students in terms of resources and services. So that is particularly why I was interested in this question, just to kind of analyze means typically among first-gen students and non-first-gen students. So my hypothesis is that first-gen students may have less knowledge about navigating resources than non-first-generation uh, students, and therefore are more likely to face greater challenges. So I particularly look at stressors and factors that I think contribute to that poor mental health. Um, and specifically, I look at, at the academic um, engagement and educational experience and how their satisfaction level from um, gen students and non first gen students. And then for my research method, I was able to use the UCUES um, survey, which is collected from data from all across nine campuses. Um, and it's about serving about 60,000 students from the academic year of 2022. Um, and then my findings did reveal that first-gen students do highlight a positive relationship with mental health uh, problems as opposed to non-first-gen students. Um, but one of my graphs does show down below here that when it comes to overall satisfaction, um, first-gen students and non-first-gen students kind of Tend to respond quite similarly. Um, yeah, my conclusion is just that the University of California should improve mental health students by shaping their experiences in a positive learning environment. Um, some implications I put forth are that there should be more research um, in piloting support and mentorship um, with that transition for first generation students to college. And there should also be some federal grants um, that kind of impose towards helping students' mental health needs and delivering on promise, uh, promises that um, help aid solutions in mental health. And that's my presentation, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Bianca, for that great presentation. And if there is a question from the internship website. All right, and if not, over to the academic team. <laughs> Oh, 
Great, Dr. Kurlander. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, would you mind, um, just because I had a hard time seeing, what were the specific um, obstacles that were named in the survey? I would love to hear how uh, UQs asked those questions. Oh yeah, the specific. Bianca, you're stop me. You're not sure if you hear me. We can't hear. Yeah, we can't hear you. Sorry. All right, Bianca, we'll we'll come back to you then in terms of maybe during the open Q and A, we'll kind of re-ask that question and then and then that way you can go ahead and answer it then. So, all right, and so um, our next student today is Patty Frutos who interned with the California Fair Political Practices Commission at CPC. Hi. <clears throat> Are you all able to see my screen? Yes, looks great, Patty. Okay, hi, my name is Patty and I go to UCI. I am a fourth year criminology law and society major, and my research question encompasses the topic of disparities in education. Um, low income minority communities are most affected in terms of education equity due to the lack of resources offered in high schools. High schools with like low income students tend not to have a, as equal resources as other high schools with more resources. Um, such as AP classes, clubs, and athletics, which allow students to have extra support and to thrive later on in higher education. I hypothesize that if having more resources and programs in low-income districts, such as AP courses, clubs and activities, and athletic programs, this will result in higher graduation rates and higher education enrollment rates. And I conducted a comparative case study amongst different school districts um, districts such as Palos Verdes, Burbank, and LAUSD. And I determined their income based on free and reduced lunch qualified students. So students that qualified for like more reduced lunch prices and stuff have low, lower income than um, students who don't qualify, which is shown here. And out of these three districts, I'm so sorry, I'm like nervous. Out of these three districts, two, of, two high schools were compared and you could see the different resources offered by high schools. And then moving on, I compared um, data between districts and graduation rates. And this is shown here. And you can see there's a disparity between graduation rates and college enrollment rates per district. So Palos Verdes has higher graduation rates than LAUSD and also higher college enrollment than LAUSD, which is like lower income district. And although like resources are essential, this does not determine the other factors not considered in other graduation like rates and enrollment rates. Um, so yeah, this is my presentation. Thank you. All right, you did great, Patty. So um, if there's a question from the internship host site. And then if not, over to our academic team. All right, Dr. Butters. Great job, Patty. Uh, thanks for sharing that presentation with us. Uh, I had a question about Belmont High School. Uh, what is going on there? It looked like the graduation rate was like 60% or something like that. Is that what's dragging down? So it's, that showed up in figure two. Uh, and then it showed up kind of again in figure three because it's part of the LA Unified School District system. So are there a bunch of schools like Belmont that are kind of dragging around, dragging down the college graduation, or sorry, high school graduation rate uh, at LAUSD and also therefore the enrollment at, at college level? So why are there such low levels of uh, graduation at Belmont? I guess is my major question. Yes, so I I did find that very interesting because I thought like most like LAUSD schools would have like really significant like low graduation rates, but um, in fact, there's some that have really high graduation rates and enrollments in college, which was very impressive to me. But I I also didn't take into consideration like areas like in which these schools are like at and other like 
resources that they might not have. So there's other multiple factors that could correlate to those um, enrollment rates and graduation rates that are not like shown here, which would be like a good thing to study in the future. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks so much, Patty, for that great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Butters, for that question. And so, so Patty was actually our last uh, presenter. And so I'm gonna go ahead and, and pause here so that Brooke can go ahead and stop the recording.